Welcome. Hi, I am Kia Levy. I serve as the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Title IX Coordinator here at uh, Simpson College. Um, I want to first thank everyone for their participation uh, who made this month success a success by participating in the various Black History Month events. Um, this month was really about highlighting the many contributions African Americans made to our great country. Uh, we started this month with several displays. One was uh, in the King Gallery, um, and that was around the Center Street neighborhood, which was a historical, predominantly Black neighborhood that was disrupted uh, with the construction of the highway. Um, there's also displays that were put up in Dunn Library to highlight Black history, but also Black women authors. Uh, we also had a variety of speaker events, um, as well as a trivia night that was hosted by Black Student Union and CAB. Uh, today, we want to really close out our month with a presentation of our Simpsons own George Washington Carver collection by our very own Sid Dyer. But before I uh, introduce her and turn it over to Sid, I'd like to first encourage you all to celebrate Black history today and every day because Black history is American history. Sid Dyer is the college librarian archivist here at Simpson College. Uh, for decades, she's worked with the Carver collection. Uh, in the college archives, assisting others with their Carver research. She currently serves on the Indianola Public Library Board of Trustees. Uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Sid. Great, good afternoon. Thank you, Kia. I appreciate you doing that wonderful introduction. And I truly appreciate doing this presentation during Black History Month. As Kia said, as college archivist, I've worked with the documents for decades, assisting others in locating research materials for them, but I've never really delved into Carver questions for myself. So I'm not a Carver expert. However, I've enjoyed pulling together these photographs, letters, interviews, and stories to share with you. So I focused on two questions. What was the relationship between Carver and Simpson College? And how is that relationship honored today? We'll start with a little background. George was born into slavery on a farm in Diamond Grove, Missouri on July 12, 1864. After the Civil War, Carver's former enslaver, Moses Carver, and his wife, Susan, raised and educated George and his brother, James. George was often in frail health, so he would work indoors, learning domestic skills. George Carver then traveled through Missouri and Kansas to get further education. He did odd jobs to earn money, often setting up a laundry. Carver is about 13 years old in this photo. In 1885, Carver sent an application to Highland University in Kansas and was accepted. However, when he arrived, he was told, we don't take Negroes here. Carver continued to work and then homesteaded in Kansas. Traveling north to Winterset in 1888, he worked at the Schultz Hotel as a cook and started a laundry. While attending the Methodist Church, Carver became friends with Dr. John and Helen Milholland. Carver gave Mrs. Milholland painting lessons and they saw his artistic talent. The couple encouraged him to apply at Simpson, a Methodist college in Indianola. Carver learned from the college catalog that the new science hall at Simpson had an elegant art room immediately under the skylight. Also noted on this same page were other reasons 
attend Simpson. There has not been for many years a beer saloon, hotel bar, nor billiard hall in the city. It is unusually quiet and pleasant and presents to the student as few unworthy attractions and allurements to vice as any town in the state. Also, equal privileges to all. The college has from the first given equal privileges to young ladies and gentlemen. Founded in 1849, Indianola had over 2,200 residents by 1890, including several black families. Many colleges began by offering high school completion classes to prepare students for college work. In Indianola, the Indianola Male and Female Seminary opened in 1860. In 1867, the school was upgraded to a college named to honor Methodism's most famous living bishop, Matthew Simpson. He had spoken at Abraham Lincoln's funeral. This 1889 engraving, you can see the three main buildings on campus. Ladies Hall, a women's residence, the chapel, and the new science hall. The college had 17 faculty and about 350 students enrolled in preparatory, business, art, music, teacher training, and college courses. At age 26, Carver walked the 25 miles from Winterset to apply in person. On September 9th, he lined up at the chapel with others to register for classes. Both the registrar and President Edmund Holmes examined his high school records. Dr. Holmes reached out and shook Carver's hand and said, Welcome to Simpson. Carver paid his $12 for the fall tuition as a select preparatory student and enrolled in grammar, arithmetic, and writing courses. According to Joseph Walt, college historian, Carver was probably the second black student to attend Simpson College. Male students lived off campus. The president allowed Carver to stay in an abandoned shack close to campus and set up a laundry. Carver's real love was art and he hoped he could enroll in the class taught by Miss Etta May Budd, Simpson's art teacher. Miss Budd was unsure of his artistic abilities. After observing him for two weeks, she agreed to let him stay. I often get requests for these two images. The class photo on the left has Etta Budd on the far left side and Carver on the far right side. And the photo on the right shows the students painting with Carver in the middle and Bud standing by a student on the right. The Bud was at Simpson for two years. She then went to work for the Melrose Art Studios in Des Moines. We have one piece of her art. It is displayed in the Matthew Simpson room. Etta called on her former art student and close friend, Sophie Liston, 
to help this very promising young man. The Listons befriended Carver and he guided her with her painting and landscaping around their home. Mrs. Liston called herself your mother in letters to Carver until her death in 1937. Great grandson Bill Liston and his family visited the college archives in 2008. Carver was popular among the students. They invited him to be a part of their literary society and the YMCA. Here are words from classmate Carl Sigler, written about 1940 and sent to President Gross. He was humble, modest, and soft-spoken, and cleaned a bunch of dirty rednecks by doing our laundry. In a letter to me, George Carver wrote, had it not been for the friendship of you boys and the fact that you played ball with me, I doubt whether I would have had the courage to pursue my education. Carver did well in college. Despite his success in art, Miss Budd was concerned that his art would not earn enough for a living. She noticed his interest in nurturing plants. So perhaps he should study botany. Miss Budd persuaded Carver to transfer to an agricultural college where her father, Dr. John Budd, was professor of horticulture. In 2009, Budd family relatives visited the college archives. Carver moved to Ames to attend the Iowa State College of Agriculture and Mechanic Arts. He was their first black student. He assisted Professor Henry C. Wallace in the greenhouse. Carver met young Henry A. Wallace, age six, who learned about plants from Carver as they walked the campus. Wallace became a pioneer in hybrid corn, Secretary of Agriculture, and Vice President under Franklin Roosevelt. In 1986, Emily Vermillion did this oil painting entitled G.W. Carver and H. Wallace. It is displayed in the Matthew Simpson room. Henry Wallace had spoken about Carver when he visited Simpson in 1956. I first met George Washington Carver when he was less than 30. George would take me out for walks with him in the prairies or woods. He would describe the different plants. He was gentle, he patient, and gave me a feeling for growing plants, which has not left me to this day. He made botany something living. There was in him a sense of destiny, which would not let him rest. His creative urge must serve the people who needed help most, his own people, the people who had not had the advantages of sympathetic contacts such as Carver had had at Simpson College. In 1894, Carver earned a Bachelor of Agriculture and was the college's first black graduate and black faculty member serving as assistant botanist. He then went on to earn a Master of Science in Agriculture. In 1996, Carver was the only black man with graduate training in scientific agriculture. 
Booker T. Washington invited him to Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute in Alabama, founded by Washington for Black students 15 years earlier. Carver taught and demonstrated science applications. He believed it was his God-given mission to improve the lives of his people. Carver developed practical uses for ordinary things while applying the chemistry of agriculture. Over 200 uses for the peanut, 100 uses for sweet potatoes, and many for cotton and soybeans. Carver produced a series of 44 free, easily understood bulletins that included information on crops and cultivation techniques to improve the conditions for Southern farmers. In 1928, Simpson was the first college to give Carver an honorary degree, Doctor of Science. However, Carver was not present to receive his degree. He had been injured by a bull in an institute pasture a few days earlier. President John Hillman said that Carver was Simpson's most distinguished son. This holiday card is the only original Carver art at Simpson. It is about six inches in length and two and a half inches wide. Here are the front and the back of the card. Professor Carver wishes Mr. and Mrs. Sims a joyous and thankful holiday season, December 1931. I have not been able to discover who Mr. and Mrs. Sims are. In 2007, I loaned this original card to the African American Museum in Cedar Rapids for a special year long exhibit. Who knew that in June 2008 would bring a great flood? I'm sure many of you remember that time. Fortunately, the curator literally moved the card higher in the building before she left, saving it. However, many Carver items on loan from other institutions were heavily damaged. It's interesting because curators weren't allowed to remove anything from the buildings, even as the water was rising. President Gross visited Tuskegee in 1940 to interview Carver in honor of 50 years of his enrollment at Simpson and to give a personal invitation to speak at the 1941 baccalaureate service. Throughout the interview, Carver worked on a yucca plant. Carver said he was just inspired. Gross had one central question. What did Simpson College do to help him on his journey. Oh, Simpson was the beginning. The friendly attitude of the people pushed me along. They made me believe I was a real human being. In this letter to Gross after the interview, Carver writes, it is impossible for me to tell you how much Simpson means to me. There is where I got my start of the inspiration to do what the great creator in his wisdom has empowered me to do. Carver came by train 
from Tuskegee to give Simpson's graduating seniors their baccalaureate address on June 1st. President Gross said at the beginning of his introduction, Carver's laboratory was God's little workshop. And to close, Simpson College did not fail Carver. Carver's talk was not written down or recorded. Over 2,000 people attended, both inside and outside the Methodist Church. They set up speakers so that everyone, wherever they were located, could hear Carver speak. He was scheduled to speak for 15 minutes. He talked about his relationship with his creator for more than an hour. Reporter Donald Grant wrote, his talks with God help the humble man. In his high squeaky voice, the tall, thin, stooped Negro talked to God. God said, take some peanuts apart and find out for yourself. Ye shall know science and science shall make you free for science is the way of the truth of the truth carver was then driven around town to see familiar sights in this photograph only the mortarboard on carver's head is visible in the car many well-wishers and photographers surrounded him this photo, a gift from Lois Godwin, is the most recent addition to the collection. After his visit, Carver wrote, I shudder to think what might have happened if Simpson College had closed its doors or failed to open them when I came hungering and thirsting for an opportunity to develop as God gave me light and strength. In November, 1941, an art exhibit opened at the Carver Museum at Tuskegee. It included 27 paintings Carver completed at Simpson. Art is an expression of the soul, Carver told President Gross, who was at the opening. Carver said, everything here is the result of a vision I had while at Simpson College. Just what was that vision, Dr. Gross asked. And for a second time, Carver stated, at Simpson College, the kind of people there made me believe I was a human being. In the middle photo, we see young Carver posing with one of these same paintings also shown in the picture on the left. Yucca and Cactus received an honorable mention at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. The last letter in our Carver collection was written to President Edward Voigt two months before Carver's passing. I have tried from time to time to express the value of Simpson College to my entire life which is practically impossible. On January 5th, 1943, Carver died. He was buried next to his mentor, Booker T. Washington. A resolution of respect was sent from Simpson to the Tuskegee Institute. In his going, 
Simpson College prays that his spirit of unselfish service and his deep devotion to truth may permeate both institutions. The same year, Congress authorized the establishment of the George Washington Carver National Monument at Carver's birthplace in Missouri. It was the first federal monument and national park dedicated to an African American. In January, 1948, the United Postal Service issued a three cent Carver postage stamp. A 32 cent stamp was issued 50 years later. Carver Science Hall was dedicated October 6, 1956. Simpson was one of the first predominantly white colleges to name a building for an African American. Speaker Ralph Bunch, Under Secretary of the United Nations, seen here in the middle photo, second from the left, met Carver when Bunch was an instructor at Howard University. Bunch said Carver loved people more than science and spoke of his indomitable spirit and international reputation. This metal object showed up on my desk several years ago. It is three inches across with a college seal on one side and a Carver quote on the other. How did this object come to be? In going through the collection, I discovered paperwork that showed in 1965, the Advancement Office placed an order for and gave Carver medallions to Indianola Sustaining Fund donors. It was the first time I had seen this particular piece. The Carver Lecture began in 1974 with speakers such as author Tony Cade Bombara, Simon Estes, and the, Rever the Reverend Jesse Jackson. Starting in 2008, the Carver Medal was presented to the speaker who exemplifies Carver's commitment and vision of service. Jean Marie Salem, Simpson class of 1991, designed the medal. The Carver Cultural Center was dedicated in 1982 as a housing unit for students interested in promoting multicultural activities on campus. And here is the Carver Center today, still active and going well. In 1990, we celebrated the Carver Centennial at Simpson College with events and speakers, including Dr. Lewis Sullivan, United States Secretary of Health and Human Services, Dr. Benjamin Payton, President of Tuskegee University, and Dr. Dolores Spike, mathematician. That same year, the George Washington Carver National Fellowship was established to recognize students' academic leadership and service endeavors with significant scholarships. Science Hall, where Carver studied, was renovated and dedicated as the Wallace Hall of Science in 1967 to honor Henry A. Wallace. In 1991, Wallace Hall was named to the National Register of Historic Places. It is the earliest known Iowa building by 19th century architects Proudfoot and Bird. The 
1993, Carver Hall was renovated, doubling in size. It was dedicated as the George Washington Carver Science Center. The millet plant specimens on display, a gift from Iowa State University, were actually pressed by Carver, one each from Winterset, Indianola, and Ames. The bust relief unveiled inside in 1956 now resides on a large rock at the north entrance. Artist Robert Amendola donated this plaster model for the bronze casting of Boy Carver to Simpson in 1993. It is displayed in the Carver Center atrium. Earlier sculptures of Boy Carver were placed in New York City's Carver housing development at the Children's Playground and at the Carver National Monument. In 2005, the American Chemical Society designated Carver's work a national historic chemical landmark. From the society's statement, he achieved international fame as a scientist and innovator who applied novel chemical insights to agriculture, urging Southern farmers to rotate cotton with soil enhancing crops such as soybeans and peanuts. In 2012, the Simpson Experience Walkway was installed in the new Kent Campus Center. We included a statement on Carver under the discovery section and at the entrance, the marble wall in memory of George Washington Carver is now in the discovery walkway from the original Carver Hall. Researchers often request items from the Carver collection. The past 20 years, I have received over 200 requests for photographs and documents from authors, the National Park Service, George Washington Carver National Monument, Iowa Public Television, Carver Museum, the Texas Cultural and Genealogical Center, Carver Bridge Scholars, Carver Fellows, and students from all over the country. From elementary school, college. Here are a few of the books that have requested the use of our Carver photos. Carver will have the last word. This quote is from the 1941 interview with President Gross. And it is still most relevant today. A religion of hate has no decent place among decent people. We must have the spirit of love. Here are the sources for my images and additional resources that may interest you. I'm happy to take your Carver questions and comments. Okay, will the proposed done renovation feature Carver art or science? Um, that is not planned at this current time. There is a lovely Carver, um, tabletop display in the Carver Science Center. Um, but this is sure an idea for um, a tabletop display that I have. So thanks Jackie for that. Was it Carver or the journalist who made the remark about science being the truth? It was Carver. So the journalist was just reporting 
what he heard at the event that day, because again, it was not, there was no written text of his speech and there was no recording to, to validate that. So that was the, the best in time article I could find about his presentation. Okay, they're popping up fast and furious here. Um, let's see. There was something in the report card about voice and piano. Um, yes, he, he took both of those types of lessons when he was here. You had to be admitted to take those lessons. Um, and I did not focus on Carver as a musician. Other folks, I believe, have done some research in that area. We have some folks who have taken classes in Science Hall that appreciated knowing the background of that. Um, I have a question here. Where was the shack where Carver lived and had a laundry? Um, there currently is a museum at the Warren County Historical Society um, where some folks have said that that was the shack where Carver lived and had his laundry. Um, but folks at Simpson tried to validate that with the Sanford fire maps and other historical investigation. And I was not able to find any validation of that in the records that we have here at Simpson. Um, do you know if any other colleges gave Carver honorary doctorates? Um, I know we have at least one or two in our files. I did not make notes of those um, since I was focusing on Simpson, but um, it was great to say that we were the first to give him an honorary doctorate. And, and he told people he never called himself Dr. Carver um, until after he was given that and only occasionally, but many, many folks called him Dr. Carver. Did anybody hear anything that they might question or that they thought was surprising? Um, I tried to go back to primary documents because I was curious um, where the marketing office got the quotes that they could keep using about Carver. You know, did he really say they made me feel like a human being or made me believe I was a human being? And I was able to find out that, yes, that was in fact. Um, in both the interview that I have the transcript from, from 1940, that was done with President Gross, and also in statements, other statements and letters. Did I miss, miss anything, Seth, in, in the quick roll through? No, I think you've covered all those questions. We have a new one though. Okay. Has this exhibit knowledge helped in recruiting more African-American students to the college? Well, Kay, you are the first to have seen this exhibit. Um, our Carver collection is actually um, five archival, large archival boxes um, with all of these um, letters and interviews in them. We have a, a list of each and every photograph and letter we have. It's on our college website under the library, under Special Collections Archives, Carver Collection, George Washington Carver. So you can find all of the types of things that we have here. And that's why I get so many requests from folks about Carver is because, you know, if you put things out there, they're on the internet, folks know that they're here, uh, but that's a great, it's, it's a great question about um, 
using this, the relationship between Carver and Simpson um, for recruiting. Sid, I will jump in with a quick question of my sure. own. Um, you had mentioned that college historian Joe Walt made a reference to the fact that Carver may have been the second African-American student to enroll at Simpson. And I'm intrigued. Uh, did Dr. Walt leave any other breadcrumbs to follow in terms of who that other student might have been? He did not. But it seemed to be from the information that he found that nobody said, oh, George Carver is the first African-American at Simpson College. I was not able to find, uh, to validate that in any way. But again, um, we lost a lot of our original documents in a college fire in 1918. So a lot of the material is reconstructed by items that happen to be elsewhere and not in that building at the time. So no, I wasn't able to validate it, but um, that's exactly the way he put it, was probably the second. Um, how many black students have been enrolled at Simpson since George Washington Carver? Oh my goodness, that's a number I do not know. Um, it has fluctuated over time, um, but that would be something that would take take some research. Um, at the at the beginning of records, that's not the kind of demographic data we kept. Um, but in our institutional data report, we have many many breakdowns um, for for types of students: traditional, evening, weekend, male, female and all of that. Getting lots of thank you. Thank you for coming. Appreciate that. Okay. Again, if you have any further questions, I'm at cyd.dyer at simpson.edu. Um, and thank you uh, for, for sharing your time today.